All right, good morning. I'm going to pass the roll sheet. I have the syllabus up on the projector to show you, to point something out to you and what we're doing. If you notice in the course schedule, it says this is subject to modification. So I'm going to have to make a slight modification. Last week we did the introduction of the course, the personal introductions. Today we're going to talk about, uh, finish talking about chapter one, move into the um, career and professional selling, and then we're going to start on relationship selling by looking at what you are going to do in terms of the end of the semester project, which is you are going to be both a buyer and a seller, and every semester I tell my students this, that you will be both a buyer and a seller, and one member of the dyad or two members of the dyad, so you're going to work in groups in two ways in here, in dyads as pairs, you're going to be a buyer and a seller, so you're going to sell a product to somebody and they're going to sell a product to you at the end of the semester. And I say this every semester, and every semester I have at least two groups that insist that they only have to have one buyer and one seller. So everybody will be a buyer and seller, and I've got this on video, and I go back and I play it for them, and, and they're still, no, you never told us that. Really? It's, it's here. Unlike Donald Trump, it's not like alternative facts. I'm not making this up. So I'm going to give you the rubric that we'll be using, and we will look at... After I finish talking a little bit about, um, or finish chapter one, we will look at some competition videos, and we'll grade those. So you're going to grade these, so look at the rubric, and I will grade these alongside you, and then I will give you a copy of how I filled out the rubric. So that you can see the way I sort of view things versus maybe the way you view things. And then if you have questions, we can discuss those. So we will do this today. I put this as subject to modification on the syllabus so that you can't file a grade deal and say it says we were supposed to do this and we didn't do that. So what I'm going to do is we're going to do this today. I'm going to talk about ethics and legal issues on the 23rd, I have to be gone on the 25th, so Dr. Morelli is going to take the class for me, so though you don't get a day off, he will be here and he will talk about the PowerPoint for Chapter 2, and then I will go back and finish uh, talking about ethics and, and legal uh, issues on January 30th. The reason I'm doing that is because that's my favorite topic to talk about in this entire course. It's also the focus of my dissertation research. And Dr. Morelli knows nothing about ethics because he's not ethical. So, and I am. So that's the way. We're, so it's a little disjointed, but again, this says so that you can't file a grade appeal. This is subject to modification. So I can't help it that I have to be gone a week from today. Uh, there will be class, and Dr. Morelli will be here, and he will take roll for that day. So if you miss it, will count against the the free or unexcused absences unless you have an excuse for that day. So I suggest you come. The fact that we have a sub doesn't mean you're not going to do anything because he will talk about that chapter. So is there, are there any questions sort of about what we're going to do for the next three class periods? No. All right. Great. So we need to finish talking about the definitions of marketing and sales within the marketing context, and we got to this first definition, and you all came up with some really good answers as to why this is really a core definition of what is the science or the domain of the discipline of marketing, because it only talks about business activities. It's one way you all came up with that. That's really good. So in 1948, um, the definition was uh, adopted by the AMA, and then it began to change. And in the mid-1980s, the AMA began significant re revisions, and the definition of marketing from the 1985 version is that marketing is the process of planning and executing the conception, pricing, promotion, and distribution of ideas, goods, and services to create exchanges that satisfy individuals and organizational uh, objectives. So I think this one is a better definition in that, first of all, it recognizes that it's not just about producing products and getting them to market to the consumers. It's also about <laughs> distributing ideas. So there's political marketing, and I teach a course called Political Marketing. 
And there are services marketing, there's nonprofit marketing, so, and all of those use sales, and so it, it encompasses this idea that it is broader than just businesses, um, that it can be both an individual or an organization. Then we get the current version, and this is not your textbook, that's a typo. Marketing is the activity for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that benefits customers, the organization, stakeholders, and society at large. I think this is a much better definition, but I think that there should be something that should be added to it. And this can be added to the definition of sales as well, and it should begin with the idea that marketing is a pervasive social activity. So the definition should begin with the idea that it is a pervasive social activity. You cannot escape it. You do it constantly. Whether you think about it or not, you market. And whether you think about it or not, you sell. You're constantly selling, even if you're not thinking about it, even if you're not conscious of it. You have needs, and you want those needs to be met. So you're going to sell yourself to employers. You're going to sell yourself you know, to your friends. You're going to sell yourself to your colleagues when you go to work. You're going to need them to help you. And you're going to want them to like you. And so marketing and sales are pervasive social activities that we do constantly, whether we think about it or not. Now, I think we probably should think more about it. I think we should be more conscious of the fact that we are constantly marketing and that we are constantly selling. Because it will make us better consumers and it will make us better producers as well. So thinking about this at a conscious level and bringing it to a conscious level I think is important. So what is need, needed for marketing and for sales to occur? You have to have more than one party. You cannot market to yourself. Just like you can't lead yourself. I had this huge debate with one of the other professors in this college who was just absolutely wrong. She <laughs> argued that you can lead yourself. You can express leadership within yourself. No, that's called motivation. That's not called leadership. It's also not called sales or marketing. You can't sell or market to yourself. So you have to have more than one person. You have to have a desire on both parties' part to be satisfied. You have to have some form of communication, and we'll talk a lot about what constitutes good communication. And you have to have something to exchange for sales or marketing to occur. What is it that you're going to exchange with your friends? If I said you were constantly selling, and you're selling yourself to your friends, what is it that you're going to exchange with them? <clears throat> can be just as much as spending time together and having good feelings. But it's something to exchange. You want your friends to do what you want to do. So you're going to sell them on the idea that they should go with you to the movies. My family is constantly trying to sell me on going to the movies. I hate going to the movies just a big waste of time. And it'll come out on video in three months anyways, won't it? I, I finally went to the movies. They finally sold me on going to the movies the other day. We went this last Sunday. And it's just a horrible experience. <laughs> You're sitting there with all these rejects from the communicable disease ward coughing and hacking. <laughs> three large drinks and two packets of candy were $40. <laughs> But they convinced me, they sold me, that I needed to go. Why did they convince me? Well, because relationships are ultimately about give and take, and selling is about give and take. And so if I want them to do things that I want them to do, go spend time on my boat, I'd like to spend time on my boat, then I need to do what they want to do. Yeah, you had a question? Hey, what movie did you see? I went to see The Greatest Showman. Oh, no. And it was, it was a good movie, I have to say. I was prepared to be horribly disappointed and it was actually a good movie. 
but I, I just hate going to the movies. I can sit at home. The picture is better on my curved TV than it is at the movie theater. I don't have to sit with somebody I don't know. And, you know, I can have vodka if I want, <laughs> rather than just die and have But I went, because they sold me on this idea that if I, if, I wanted to, if I wanted them to do what I want to do, then I needed to give and take. So they sold me on that. Any questions about that? All right. Well, let's talk about chapter one. So I just told you that everybody sells something. You sell friendship, you sell your labor. So everybody lives by selling. And even if you don't want to go into sales, which is something that I think you should seriously consider because the advantages of a sales career far outweigh the disadvantages of a sales career. But even if you decide that you are an accountant and you want to sit there with you know, a, a dusty set of books and do double entry bookkeeping while you slurp down coffee and smoke cigarettes or whatever it is that accountants do and their antisocial, you know, tendencies. They still have to sell something. They still have to sell themselves to their company and the idea that they're necessary and that you need to know that debits are on the left and credits are on the right or whatever it is that they're, they're currently peddling. So these skills are transferable even if you don't want to get a, a, a sales job. Even if you decide after this semester that sales are just not for you, it's still transferable to other, other contexts. And of course, since I teach political marketing, I put politicians try to persuade. What are the Democrats going to try and do? They're going to try and sell the American public on the idea that they need to get control of Congress in order to stop Donald Trump and his uh, ideas from taking hold. That's, they're going to try and sell you this year in the midterm elections come November. They're going to try and get you to give them your vote. So politicians sell. Friends try to influence each other and family relations involve persuasion. So all of these, are, these skills that you'll learn here are applicable to other contexts as well. What are the value of salespeople? Well, fundamentally, if you, I, I realize that the finance people think that finance makes the world go round, and the accountants think that accounting makes the world, and they're just wrong. You can run a business without knowing anything about high finance, without knowing how to value a business in the scientific sense. You can run a business without knowing anything about double entry bookkeeping. Lots of businesses do. In fact, in a day and age when you can get online and you can look at your accounts all the time, I'm not sure how useful double entry bookkeeping is anymore. But you have to have something to sell and you have to have people to sell it. Fundamentally, you have to have something to sell and you have to have people to sell it. Now, some products are sold more easily than others. You can get them out of a vending machine, so it doesn't take a lot to sell them. But you're going to have to have something to sell. New and innovative products require lots of personal selling or professional selling in order to get people to overcome their resistance. I asked you, so Google has come out with the Google phone, the Google Pixel. I asked you how many of you had an iPhone in here. The vast majority of you had an iPhone. Google really needs to work on their, you know, people convincing you that you want to switch and that the switching costs of, of going from the iPhone to the Google Pixel are worth it. When radically new products, when we have what's called disruptive technology come about, it really takes a lot of selling to get those adopted in many instances. Salespeople are also an important part of the company in terms of they are a valuable source of information. They're constantly involved in what we call environmental scanning and marketing, doing an environmental scan of what's going on out there and reporting back to the company what the trends are. So I like to eat, 
and I like to cook. How many of you know what sous vide is in cooking? Sous vide. What is it? Yeah, you don't boil it necessarily. Actually, a lot of a lot of steakhouses now, you can you can put it in uh, a shrink wrapped or a plastic wrapped container. A lot of steakhouses now keep a whole bunch of steaks in different temperatures because it will keep it at exactly, and that's the way they can get the steak out. I think Outback has actually gone to sous vide. Uh, the so they just throw it on the grill for a few seconds to get it to get that kind of uh, cooked look on it, but they keep it in various temperatures of water, everything from rare to well done, and it's a very efficient way of cooking. When this technique first started to be adopted by restaurants, and they came up with products that did this, somebody had to sell it. And there was resistance on the part of chefs to do this because historically that's not what they did in terms of cooking. And so you have to get people to adopt this stuff. Now it's catching on, and salespeople are, are able to look at what is the newest. They're, they're able to monitor, in many instances, the competition. Because they're going out and talking to customers who have maybe the competitor's products. So salespeople are needed to identify potential customers and their needs, to determine how the company can best satisfy those, to communicate with the customer about the benefits or advantages of a company's products or, or offerings. And so you can't survive without sales in a company. Again, you can survive without finance, you can survive without a CFO, you can survive without uh, an accountant in many instances. You can't survive without selling. As a result, compensation for salespeople is generally pretty high. And it's maybe the only industry that you can go into and you can determine your own salary. One of my friends is a salesperson for US Foods, and he says, you know, if I want to take my kids to Disney World this year, all I have to do is sell an additional $1,000 worth of products a month. Just make more calls and sell more stuff, and I can, I can afford. So it's, it's one of the areas where you can set your own salary. So it's a critical function our, in our economy. What keeps our economy chugging along? It's largely driven by consumer demand. So what do you need to be successful in sales? <laughs> you need to have ethics, I think. Again, going back to this idea of, and this is how everything is sort of interrelated, those eras in marketing, the production era, if you build it, they will come. Well, if there isn't something out there that satisfies needs and wants, you may have a fairly easy time of it. That's going to be more, <coughs> more difficult in a highly complex environment because we have so many products that are competing for our needs and wants or to satisfy our needs and wants that we really had to move beyond that. During the sales era, it was about making that pitch. And a lot of the negative attitude that we get about salespeople is from that era, where it's just about making a pitch, selling the product, and moving on down the road. And if you use that model and you don't have a lot of integrity and you don't have ethical standards, and I realize that in today's age, where it seems that people are less truthful than ever because we have them caught on video doing this, I, I will tell you that customers will remember. And you will probably not be very successful, ultimately, if you use that just transactional snake oil kind of methodology for selling something. So I think ethics, and that's one of the reasons why I'm not going to let Dr. Morelli talk about it, because it's my favorite topic, are enormously important. Now, I will tell you it's the most frustrating part of the course because a lot of people think that they know what's ethical. They think it's a gut check, and it's not necessarily, but it's enormously important. You have to have a positive self-image. Now, your text says that anybody can be taught to sell. I don't know that that's true. 
again, the faculty member of the College of Business who told me that you could lead yourself also argues that anybody can be a leader. I don't know that that's true. I think you can take people and make them better at something, but if somebody just does not want, if they are an antisocial, withdrawn, you know, hermit, I don't know that I can make them a salesperson. <coughs> so there's a nature-nurture debate here. Are salespeople born or are they made? My brother's best friend in high school was this kid, or actually starting in the second grade all the way through high school, was this kid named Garrett Vance. You might have heard of his father. His name is John Vance. He owns John Vance Motors in Guthrie, where their motto is, it's comfortable, it's so comfortable to buy a truck. I don't know what that means. I love John. He's a friend of mine. I'm not sure what that, what that means. Uh, but, you know, it's working, apparently, for them. Somebody else apparently knows what that means. And his kid, Garrett, who was my brother's best friend, was constantly selling. I mean, from the time that kid was, like, he, he, was, con he was constantly conning me. And I, Stop conning me, kid. And he's really good at it. And I can tell you he's never taken a course in selling, and he doesn't have a degree. And he's a really good salesman. So there are people. Is it nature or is it nurture? Can we make somebody better, I think we can, but can you take somebody who just inherently has a fear of, you know, other people, who's agoraphobic, and turn them into a salesperson? I'm not sure, but I can. Now, it's a spectrum, right? So there's, you know, complete introvert here, complete extrovert here, and most people are somewhere on the spectrum in the middle. And those people we can make better. Most people are not Garrett Vance. That just were sort of born. He, he, can, talk, he can talk a million miles uh, a minute, and he's good at it, yeah. So what would you say is like the biggest obstacle to get maybe from that area? Into the extreme extrovert? Yeah. <clears throat> it's overcoming the fear okay. of rejection, usually. And there are a couple of things you can do to do that. Most people have a horrible fear of talking in public. I don't understand this. And in sales, a lot of it is not going to be just one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to have to make presentations to, particularly in the type of selling that you all will most likely do, it's going to be more than one-on-one. -on -one. If you're selling cars, that's going to be a one-on-one -on -one experience. If you're selling business products, you're going to have to go in and talk to more than one person. And for most people, the idea of speaking in public is absolutely horrific. And I don't get that. I wanted to be a country and western superstar, but I'm a tone deaf flat baritone. So I had to become a college professor in order to have an audience instead. This is the way I get to perform. The first time I walked, I was 22 years old when I started teaching here at UCO. And the first time I walked into a college classroom and gave my first lecture, I thought, they're paying me for this? I thought it was absolutely the greatest thing I've ever done in my entire I just love it. It's one of the reasons I record these classes, because I am enamored with my own voice. <laughs> I have a narcissistic personality disorder. And I, I like it. But there are things you can do to get better at this. One of the things that you can do to get better at talking in public is there are groups that are called Toastmasters, which give you practice at giving speeches. And that's one of the things that I recommend that you join as a Toastmasters group. If you have a horrible <coughs> fear of speaking in public, join Toastmasters. The second thing that you can do is it doesn't matter. I am horrible. And you can look on my YouTube channel, and you can find videos of me doing karaoke. My friends absolutely hate it when I start this. But I am, you know, I, if there's a karaoke machine around, I'm there. <laughs> do karaoke. The advantages of doing karaoke are that it will get you comfortable in being in front of people, and you don't have to think about the words to start out with. The words are there on the screen for you. And you can do it. And it may be awful. People say, I can't sing. Anybody can sing. Whether or not it's good is something else. But you can, you know, I, that's one of the things you can do. You can do karaoke because 
it'll get you in front of a crowd of people. Most of them will not be paying attention to you. Because if you've ever been to a karaoke bar, everybody's more worried about what they're going to sing at their next song than they're paying attention to you. But it, it, it will overcome that fear. And then Toastmasters will help you learn how to talk beyond just saying the words. Both of those things are things that I think you can do. So you have to have the ability to cultivate and maintain relationships. Again, I talked about this before. This idea of customer lifetime value is enormously important. We want to keep <coughs> customers. It's easier for me to keep a customer than it is to go out and prospect for customers. We're going to talk about prospecting. It's one of the hardest things that salespeople have to do because, A, it's kind of a lonely process to prospect. B, it's really hard. It involves research and work and not just talking. But if you can keep, you know, you can build a book of business and not really necessarily have to go out and do a whole lot of prospecting if you're good enough at this and keeping those relationships <coughs> that you have already got established. There comes a point, for example, I have a friend who's an insurance salesman. There comes a point at which he has, he's an independent, he has his own company, and he's the only agent in his office. He really can't build a bigger book of business at this point because, but he's making a lot of money off of just the residuals that you get from that customer lifetime value. It's also one that requires intellectual development and empathy. Now this is one of the hardest things to have, is empathy. And I'll give you an example of this. I oftentimes tell students that I have no sympathy for you. When you come up and you tell me things like, oh, I had a student two semesters ago, insist that if I gave her an F in my class that she was living off of her student loans and that they would throw her out of her apartment, she would be living on the street in boxes by Wednesday after grades were due, if I, if I did this. And I said, tough. And then she started with the threats. I'm going to file a great appeal. Okay, go ahead. Good luck with that. I used to be the school's attorney, so I kind of know how that, I sat in on thousands of great appeals. I kind of know how these go. But go ahead, file. Guess you get to file, oh, you get to file with my best friend, who was my boss. Again, good luck. But I say I have a lot of empathy for you, because having gone through a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a Juris Doctor, and a PhD program, I've sat where you sat for thousands of hours. So I know what it is to sit where you sit, and to sweat it, and to worry about exams. But do I really have empathy for you? I don't know. I say I do, but when I went to college, and it's not been that many years ago, it was relatively cheap. Tuition at OU was less than $1,500. When I went to OU, it was less than $1,500 a semester. Now, books were expensive, so it ran about $3,000 a semester for books and tuition. My family could afford to pay for that. I didn't have to work. The vast majority of you will not graduate in four years. We call it a four-year degree, and the vast majority of people won't graduate in four years because they have to work. It's expensive. It's no longer $1,500 to come to class. And books are just crazy expensive anymore. And all the other stuff they expect you to get, like Connect, for how many of you like, have got classes that they expect you to have Connect? I absolutely despise Connect. I hate it. It's a horrible product. It's just a cheap way to get grades. Yeah. Like, the professors don't have to grade it, but we have to pay, like, 200 bucks. For, for Connect. Time, and it's not fair. Yeah. yeah, I hate Connect. I, I just hate it. It's one, of the, it's one of my biggest pet peeves. And so, you know, I don't know that I do have any empathy for you. When I went to school, it was radically different. It wasn't that expensive. My family paid for it. And even if my family couldn't pay for it, I could, you know, I probably could have paid for it fairly easily. I graduated with no debt. That's not what happens now. The average undergraduate across the United States is coming out with $30,000 in debt. 
That's average. There are a lot of people that are coming out with far more than that. So do I really have a lot of empathy? Is it possible to have a, uh, a lot of empathy? Well, I don't know. It's really, really hard. And it's one of the harder skills to, to learn, is actually to be empathetic. Can you actually put yourself in somebody else's shoes? It's really difficult. Can you ever imagine being anyone other than who you are? <coughs> that's really, really hard. But it's a skill that's really necessary in, in selling, is intellectual uh, development and empathy. And what we might call emotional intelligence is important. So what are the basics? Well, you have to identify needs, which is prospecting. And we'll talk about that. We'll do an exercise on prospecting. Then you have to identify or get potential customers to recognize their needs. A lot of times, customers don't know that they necessarily have a need. Again, going back to when I was growing up, I remember my first cell phone. I got it when I was in high school. It was a bag phone. It weighed seven pounds. This was high technology. It plugged into your cigarette lighter. And it had talk time of about 15 minutes, and the battery would go down if it wasn't plugged in. And it would stay on for about eight hours without being charged. And it had talk time of 15 minutes. It was wildly expensive. And that was seen as a real luxury when I got the first bag phone. Is this a luxury today? It's pretty much a necessity, isn't it? At this point. Okay, that's exactly right. That's that's the point that I'm trying to make is that a lot of times do I need all of the stuff that this phone will do? The ability to control that camera back there with this phone. Do I really need it? I could just walk back there, I could just ask one of you to hit the button and turn it on. Of course I can also zoom in and zoom out with this, which is useful. Do I need that? I wanted it, but I had no idea when I first started teaching and when I first started recording classes, I had no idea that this was such a wonderful thing that I needed. And it took a salesperson like convincing me to buy that camera because it had a, an app that you could connect to your phone and control it that way. So a lot of times we don't know what we need or what we want or what might be beneficial without salespeople helping us recognize unfulfilled potential. <laughs> now when we talk about ethics, this can be controversial because a lot of times as philosophers <laughs> say that what we're actually doing with salespeople and marketing is not necessarily helping people realize their potential. We're creating irrational wants and needs. And that may be true, and I think that's worth thinking about. So we provide solutions to meet those needs. And then persuading customers to make or use our product or service, to adopt our product or service. And we'll talk about each of these parts in depth. What are the advantages of a sales career? Well, I've talked a lot about this. Obviously, one of the big advantages is pay. I said that already. But there are other advantages. Independence. Most salespeople, one of the things that's great about having a sales job is that you may have a boss but particularly for those of you who want to go into business-to-business -business sales, you're not going to have somebody standing over you all the time. They can't. If you sell, for example, one of our most recent graduates who's highly successful, Jonathan Carter, who was one of our competitors on the, on the sales team, went to work for Henry Schein. It requires, his boss has probably 15 <coughs> other reps that he supervises. And it requires him to go out and sell dental products. His boss cannot be in 15 different places at once. So what do you have to have? You have to have a, you have a lot of independence. That can mean that you can largely set your own schedule in many instances. You can decide which prospects you want to go talk to today. How you're going to manage your territory. That can also be 
A disadvantage, though, for what kind of personality? What's that? Introverts? Maybe. I'm thinking more about people who are what? Lazy. It can be a real disadvantage for people. I mean, if you have a tendency to procrastinate and not do things, you may not be real good at the independence of it. Because, you know, I'll, I can go play golf today. I'll make it up by selling or prospecting or calling on 10 more people tomorrow. And tomorrow comes and it's easy to say what? I'll go play golf again today. So it's an advantage and a disadvantage. Variety, one of the things that's really good about a sales career is that it's probably not going to be the same from day to day. You're going to meet a lot of different people. It's not like balancing checkbooks or filing 10 Qs and 10 Ks. The numbers sort of change, maybe. In most businesses, they don't change a whole lot. When I was in the private sector, that was one of the things I was responsible for as general counsel for the company that I worked for. I was responsible for working on and filing our 10 Qs and our 10 Ks. We were a publicly traded company. It didn't change much. When the end of the quarter came up, I knew what I was going to be doing. And it was pretty boring. And it was the same. I mean, the numbers kind of changed, you know, around the margins, but the format and all of that pretty much stayed the same. That's not the way it is in sales. It's constantly going to be changing. What one person picks up on or thinks is an advantage, somebody else may think is a disadvantage. And so you're going to have this broad range of experience in dealing with people. There are lots of opportunities for advancement. Since all companies have to have sales, sales is generally a very good way to move up. Now, having said that, most of my most successful sales students don't want to move into management. Why is that? You make more money in sales. There are lots of salesmen that make far more money than their sales managers. Because generally, what's the advantage of going into the sales management? Well, you get a higher salary, but generally less variable compensation. And so a lot of my most successful sales students never ever want to move into management. Because it limits how much you're going to make. Now the advantage is that you don't necessarily have, if you're a sales manager, the strict quotas that you're going to have as the salesperson, although if you have a, a team that's just not performing well, that will ultimately reflect on you, but you're going to have a higher generally base salary but less variable compensation. But there are, there are lots of opportunities for advancement, and it's a great way to develop entrepreneurship skills if you want to start your own business. And a lot of my sales students start out working for somebody, but they want to start their own business. One of my sales students went on uh, to working for a company. That company also uses independent distributor networks, and he's gone on and started his own company selling a variety of products in the educational software field. And he learned those skills and got the idea for it by starting out in the sales career. So it's a great way to develop entrepreneurship skills and find opportunities to be able to get out there and See what uh, you can do to fulfill needs and maybe build a better mousetrap. The disadvantages. Salary can be very variable. Now, most of our sales positions that our students go into are going to be a base plus commission type structure. And the average base commission structure that we have is generally um, between thirty and fifty thousand dollar base plus commission. Now, if you don't sell more than you cost, you're not going to keep your job, which can be pressure and can be difficult. But it also means that it can be highly variable. When certain things go down, right now, uh, the student that I have that's selling educational software. It's harder to do in this current climate because what's happening in places like he's still here in Oklahoma, what's happening in Oklahoma right now with our budget situation? Anybody know? We're having, well, we, don't, we can't have deficits in Oklahoma because we have what's called the balanced budget amendment 
to our Constitution, which is sort of a, a falsehood, because there's a way that they can get around it, but we have a huge budget crisis that they're going to have to make up. So, for example, UCO has been told that we're going to have to give back this, this fiscal year 6% to the state. We're going to have to remit back. That makes it hard to sell educational products. Because school districts, where's the, if you have a state government and you're running the state, what can't you cut? Well, in Oklahoma, the thing we're not going to cut is prisons. Because we just love to lock people up. You know, can't cut that. Where can you cut? You can cut education. Can't you? It's pretty easy. That's, the, that's usually the first people that get hit and cut. So that can be... Uh, really uh, a disadvantage is that if you, if you are in a sector that takes an economic downturn, it can really, really cut into your salary and your commission structure. There are oftentimes lots of irregular hours. So if you're selling and you're out traveling, you may be overnight. That can be a disadvantage to a lot of people, particularly when you are starting a family. For a lot of people, that's a concern. Travel can be difficult. That can also be an advantage. One of the things I liked about working in a publicly traded company and being part of the sales process was I enjoyed the travel, but I didn't have kids. And so I looked at that as an advantage, the opportunity to go and see and go to trade shows and see different things. And I thought that was an advantage, but a lot of people think it's a disadvantage. Handling rejection is the biggest thing. You have to sort of be <coughs> thick-skinned and maybe a little bit of a rejection junkie to be really good at sales, because you're going to get told no a lot, and you have to be able to handle that. If you internalize that and you take that as a personal assault on you, you're probably not going to be good at sales. One of my colleagues in the doctoral program, he was the other Judd Fudd in our, in our PhD cohort, in other words, he had the JD as well. He always, I mean, when he would get papers back from our professors, and when he was working on his dissertation, they would give him these rewrites. And he took that as enormously, it took him a long, it took him a lot longer to get his PhD than it did me. Because when they gave me rewrites on my dissertation, I was just like, yep, yeah, okay, accept all changes and go on down the road. But he took that as a personal affront to him. And he could never have been a salesperson like him because he just did not deal well with being told no. And if you don't deal well with no, you're probably going to have a, a, a problem in sales. So handling rejection, and that is what most salespeople say is the biggest disadvantage and is the hardest thing to overcome, is being told no constantly. You should know about different types of sales jobs that you can have and the way we classify <coughs> trade, uh, classify trade, or classify selling jobs. There's trade selling. You are usually selling to buyers who are resellers. So the example is Dallas Market. There are people that go that sell for companies at market, and they sell primarily to uh, B2C and B2C businesses, and they're trying to get you to buy their products and stock it on your shelves or in your store. And they go to a lot of these trade shows and, and sell that way. Missionary sales, that's a big one for a lot of our sales students. They actually go, a lot of our sales students go into pharmaceutical sales. You're not actually selling to a doctor when you go into pharmaceutical sales. You're trying to get the doctor to do what? Use, Use your or prescribe your particular product. <coughs> and so that's missionary selling. Educating the people who will ultimately decide what product a customer will use. What product the doctor will prescribe for various things. There's lots of different treatments out there for example, for gastrointestinal problems. I have a friend who she sells, uh, she's a pharmaceutical rep for a company that sells C. Def remedies. There are lots of different remedies out there. You're trying to convince the doctors and the hospitals to use yours. Technical selling, in many instances now, we see team selling, we'll talk a lot about this, where you have technical people that can actually talk about the specifics. So for example, the company that I worked for 
we had a team of people that would go in, out and sell. Part of that was I was on part of the teams that went out and sold because I had to understand the legal requirements in dealing with school boards and school districts and higher education institutions and be able to talk to them about whether or not we could meet the requirements of their request for proposal. And then we also had computer programmers that were part of the sales team because they could go out and talk. That's what we sold. We sold learning management systems for K through 12, and we also had a, higher, a small higher education product. So we would have to have a technical person that was also a part of the sales team that could go out and talk about how they were going to implement this with the IT people at various school districts or various prisons. So for example, when we'd sell to prisons, we had to have people that were experts on installing or helping their IT people install on a LAN rather than on a downloadable uh, web-based platform. Why is that? Well, when we sold to prisons, what can't they have in prison for the most part? Mm -hmm. Internet. Because if they do, the prisoners will start doing what? Organizing. They'll start going and engaging in illegal trade on the internet. So you had to do it within. So we had technical people that would go out and that, that technical person changed depending on what their expertise was. New business development. That's for firms that are seeking to grow. <clears throat> Generally, what you're not going to be doing after you graduate with a sales degree is order taking for the most part. I mean, you're going to take orders, but you're not just going to be an order taker. What are examples of just order takers? Inbound call centers are just order takers. Doesn't necessarily, their product range is usually less varied, more narrowly <coughs> tailored, and they don't have to respond to a whole lot. It's generally very basic sales. And then there's order getting which involves creative problem solving and, and actually marketing your products and services to customers. Any questions about that? <clears throat> All right, I know I went through that really quickly, so if you have questions, let me know. Take your rubric out, and what we'll do is I will we'll watch a couple of videos. <clears throat> For the first one, I don't want you to for it. I just want you to sort of look at the rubric and we'll watch too. Yeah. Maybe I'll see. Yeah. I want you just to watch the first one and sort of look at the rubric as you're watching it. Nice to meet you, sir. Please have a seat. Thank you. I appreciate it. How's everything going today? It's been a busy one. How about yourself? It's also busy, yeah. Which for you is a good thing. It may uh, as well. That's good. It right? keeps us off the streets, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the weather is kind of uh, 
bring in bring a lot of your customers in. Would you agree? Nah, I would say anytime you're serving <laughs> some frosty and cold that's warm outside, it, it helps. Definitely. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you for being with me today. Yeah. Uh, I did want to. Now, I will tell you up front though. Sure. I'm not buying anything today, just so you know. Sure. Because I know you you guys out there, the profession that you do, you're out knocking on doors, making money, and I know time is money for all of us. I know you're just, I'm, I'm doing some fact-finding right now, do a little comparative shopping, but that's about the extent of it. Sure, I, I can definitely understand that. Okay. Uh, a lot of my a lot of my pre, our customers now have, have said the same thing uh, in our okay. initial meeting, so uh, uh, really what I want to do today with you is just kind of get to know you better, mm -hmm. um, know where your business is going, and, and see if we are a good fit for you. If we are, fantastic, and if we're not, that's okay. I made a great relationship out of it. That sound fair? Fair enough. Perfect. So I do want to go ahead and give you my business card. So that way you can have my information going forward past today's meeting. Okay. So if you need anything, you know, definitely let me know. Um, as I said, now I, I guess let me back up first, you know, because I haven't met you before then when we spoke on the phone, but we agreed on 20 minutes last week. Yeah, it's 20 minutes to the T because I've got okay. I've got meetings stacked up all afternoon. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I appreciate you letting me, you know, come in today. As I said. Yeah. Um, so, as I said, what I want to do is just kind of get to know you a little better. So, let's just start there. Okay. Um, kind of give you a little background about, I guess, how I got here. Mm -hmm. Allie Boardman, one of your accountants, or she works at your accounting firm, mm -hmm. uh, introduced me, or well, we connected on LinkedIn, okay. and said that uh, we both might benefit from our relationship here today. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's, that's why I'm here. And she yeah. told me that you all went to Italy recently, and I actually uh, got engaged in Italy about, oh, about a year ago. Yeah. And a business, so uh, you know, walking into your store makes you feel at home, basically. Or uh, that's the way it's supposed to make bring back memories. Yeah, so, it's good to hear. Uh, and do you mind if I take notes about today's meeting? No problem. Okay, perfect. So, um, I guess tell me a little bit about your vacation and and uh, what made you want to start your business. Um, well, vacation, wow, it seemed like years ago now. Um, you always got to take a vacation to get caught up from all the work you missed while you're on vacation. Um, yeah, I went to Italy with the family. Um, mom and dad, brothers and sisters, and we hit four different areas in Italy, four different cities, and one of the things that, um, you know, you pick up a rock and throw it on any corner and you hit a gelato shop. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I clueless as to what gelato was. I mean, I'd always heard about it, but uh, went in, started to do some research and just found out more about it, and it seemed interesting, and, you know, here in the Atlanta market, it just seemed like a niche. And so... Um, yeah, so what you see, and you mentioned yourself, that you kind of took your memory back to when you got engaged, Absolutely. and that's, that's the exact environment we're looking to go after. Absolutely. You know, we're using all imported ingredients, with the exception of the butter fat and the sugar. Um, so all these are imported ingredients, which means, you know, that jacks up the price on, on your, your service unit, right? Sure. Um, but to, to come into just a basic counter, and have somebody pay a price like that, they've got to have the, the full feel of it. Sure, it's got to be that ambiance. Sure, but at the same ambiance. time, it's got to be quality goods. Because you, you know, you've been, I'm sure you've been to nice dining restaurants before and the food was horrible. Sure. Yeah, right? All right. <laughs> right. So, so you're got, paying for the ambiance. Yeah. All right. So that's not what happens here. You know, not only are you getting the authentic Italian decor and feel, each of the shops is individually decorated so they don't even look the same. Sure. It's just the same logo on the outside. And as long as you get that feel and you get that authentic Italian product, then we feel it's worth the price that we charge for it. And so that's kind of that's where we are. the vision that we had and where we started sure. today. Yeah, and I think on that note, you made you made a lot of good points there. ADP and your and the gelato shop, I think, actually have a lot in common based on what you just said. You know, um, we are the premium service provider for payroll and, and other HR functions, which we'll talk about today. Um, and, you know... I'm not gonna lie to you. There, there are cheaper products out there, but as you mm -hmm. said, you pay for not only the ser uh, the service, but also the quality, mm -hmm. other things like ease of use and things like that. Well, I can get that, but I tell you what, the word premium makes me a little nervous because anytime you're talking premium, if it's anything like I've been, my business, premium costs you a little bit more. And I, I will tell you, um, you know, I I am shopping around to find out if I can get the best deal out there. Sure. Yeah. And and that's definitely you know uh, understandable. Like I said, a lot of people have done that before. Um, would you say that cost is probably one of your main concerns, or it's? Well, I don't know. You go to the store and you got to take something off the shelf and buy it. What's the first thing you look at? Sure, you look at the price. You look at the price. Sure, I think price is part of any equation when when you're looking at something. And, and, I, and I'm not, I don't give you the wrong impression. I mean, cheap is what you pay. Cheap is what you get. And I, I 
but I'm also not wanting to pay through the nose for sure. unless something is dramatically different than where I am today. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree 100%. And so with a decision um, like partnering with ADP and, uh, and going forward or with any business, would you say that you're probably the main decision maker or, or is there anyone else that... I don't know. Be... This, the, the, you know. I'm in business with my brother and sister. Um, okay. I wish I was in business with my brother <laughs> and sister, but I am. Uh, but the, the buck stops here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Um, well, so I guess uh, Allie said that you all were franchising or are looking at franchising. You know, it's out there on the horizon. Okay. Uh, I've contracted with a consultant to take a look at, you know, opportunities of franchising and what that might look like. But, you know, like I said, I'm, if you ever can avoid going into business with your relatives, I recommend <laughs> that you do that. Okay. Um, I mean, I love them to death, but to be in business with them is, is probably the craziest thing I've ever done. Um, yeah, so it's kind of up in the air. If, sure. if, if I could change them out, I would be a lot more toward the franchising. Okay. But it would break mom's heart to switch them out, so I don't know whether it's just, you know, where my head is at this point, it might be cheaper just to get the value up and sell her off, you know, sure. that kind of thing. Yeah, well, like I said, we do want to help you grow, so whatever we can do to help, you know, uh, even if it's not anything regarding we talked about today, mm -hmm. definitely let me know. Um, one of the things that we do specialize at ADP is payroll. So I wanted to get an idea of what you're doing currently uh, from basically start to finish on how you pay your employees from. It's a pretty simple setup. Um, you, know, you can't go around with people's payroll. Absolutely. So I've got a um, you know, majority of my workforce in the three shops is part time. Um, and we work with our current vendor, Paychecks, is, uh, they've got their key in system. And um, you know, they key in, they key out, and each of the managers does a dis digital worksheet, sends it across to my sister Dorothy every week. She updates it in the system, and then she writes out the checks for each of the locations, and then we send them across by courier. So it's, okay. All right. You know, my whole deal is, is if you keep it simple, less can go wrong. Absolutely. You start getting a lot of whistles and bells cranked in there, and then that just causes things to get squirrely. Sure, fast. sure, I'd agree with you 100%. So on that note, if I could show you something that um, is very simple and straightforward that would eliminate some of the uh, passing through, you know, it goes to manager and then it goes to Dorothy. And so there's there's some room for error there um, or, or opportunity for error. Um, and so if I could show you something that would reduce that risk, is that something that you'd be interested in seeing? Um, you know, I gotta tell you, with my current supplier is doing doing just fine now. So like I said, it, you know, a few seconds ago, it, if it's something that is, I can see a significant cost savings in, and it's better than what I have today, it might be worth looking at. But okay. if, it's, if it's apples to apples, and you know, because what I've seen so far, and, and not to disparage what you guys do, but you know, you guys are all pretty much the same. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, so I can understand that. Yeah. Um, so with, I guess with that viewpoint, um, just to clarify, Earlier on, you told me that you're shopping around. Mm -hmm. uh, is there something in particular or a reason why you're shopping around? I mean, you said you're happy with paychecks, but you're also shopping around at the same time. Is there a particular reason for that? Yeah, you know, when we started this thing back in 2008, we started with paychecks. And, you know, it's 2015 and going into, you know, our, our, our fiscal year starts on July 1st. Um, so it's coming back around um, here pretty soon. And again, you know, you look at the franchise. Uh, that's one direction, but like I told you, I get, if I could get some different business partners, franchising would be a real serious consideration. Sure. But right now with the siblings, you know, I, if I can get the value of the organization up and keep costs down, then it, it might be worth it to, to put it out there for sale. Sure. Um, so like I said, I'm just doing both of them are kind of distant on the fringe okay. views. Yeah. Um, possibilities. Possibilities, and I'm just looking to see what, what's out there and what I might be able to do. Okay. But that's why I was telling you, I, I'm not anywhere near being able or wanting to even make a decision on anything like that. Sure, sure, absolutely. Today. Yeah. Um, so with, uh, going back to the payroll, and I know your managers and Dorothy spend, it sounds like at least quite a bit of time on uh, every week, you know, actually processing that. Could you put a number to that? Like maybe an hour a week or four hours a week or? I think for the managers, it, it's pretty, I mean, they just, they just kind of send it off. The key they, yeah, sure. it's just more just sending it off. I mean, you know, Dorothy, and, and I really can't even say that's the system as much as it is her. She's just disorganized for days. You know, she's got three kids and she's managing the HR and she also does the marketing piece for our organization. But, you know, I've grown up with her and <laughs> she's been 
couple spots missing from the dominoes for a few years, you know what I mean, and she's just scattered. And if she gets her act together, you know, that's one thing. Um, yeah, she's probably five, six hours a week okay. that she spends on it. But um, okay. like I said, I don't know how much of that is the system versus how much of that is Dorothy. Sure, sure. Either way, it's consuming uh, five to six hours, right? Can we agree on that? Sure. Okay, perfect. Now, what we found out with, with almost all of our clients is that on average, we can take something like five or six hours, which is normal, mm -hmm. and with our service, we can cut that down by about two thirds. So she's going to be spending probably closer to two to two and a half hours uh, each week. Now, with the remaining hours that she would have freed up, what would she be doing, or, or how could your company benefit from that time instead of payroll? Well, if I can get her out of her HR mindset constantly and get some work life balance, she needs to throw some weight behind marketing. I mean, we've got a great concept, we've got, we've got a niche market, we've got you know, great shopping centers, high-end shopping centers here in the Atlanta market area. Um, there's no reason why this thing can't grow, and it just, it's just frustrating for me that it's stalled as much as it is at this point. Um, but again, then you pay for a system, and whatever she's saving on the system, you know, you're going to end up spending that on marketing. So, you know, you're sure. damned if you do, damned if you don't. But. Well, and I think the difference between that is is that one, you know, you save money and spend it somewhere else, but mm -hmm. somehow, oftentimes in marketing, if you spend money in advertising, you can turn that around and it'll produce more money for you. Or something like payroll, Hopefully. it doesn't generate any revenue, right? Yeah, that's a fair statement. Um, so, with that five to six hours a week, um, how if you had to put a monetary value to that, what would that be? Because I know cost is important to you. her salary and then if you look at it breaking down probably a couple hundred dollars a week okay all right that's that's fair so uh, and, and the reason why I'm asking that is I want to because cost is important to you so mm -hmm. I do want to address that with you today because you know we don't want to we want to get the elephant out of the room right so, sure um, so I like to look at things typically on an annual basis mm -hmm. because um, because that's what we do when we try to grow right sure. so um, let me go ahead and um, just kind of put this together for you okay. real fast, and then I'll go ahead and do the presentation. We'll look at cost. Does that sound okay? All right. Just as long as you're cool on me not signing anything, sure. you're going to need yeah. that. It's just helping me gather some information. So sure, sure. sure. And, and on that uh, on that basis, is there a particular reason for that uh, that you're that you're not wanting to move forward, or uh, just you know thinking about it, making sure I get all my ducks in a row? Okay. All right. That's fair. I can understand that. Um, well, do you think, I guess, I kind of want to recap very, very quickly um, to make sure I got an understanding. So, um, right now, I think uh, probably time and or money is, is probably the main issue um, that, that we have or something that we can improve on, not necessarily an issue. Um, but she's spending a good amount of time, five to six hours a week, um, which it, it actually calculates up to almost $11,000 a year um, that, you're, that you're spending right now in, in her salary, in addition to paying paychecks, right? So... The uh, 11 grand is what the 200 times the 52 weeks a year. Yes, yep, you got it. And, um, you know, I think that we, we agreed that if we can free up some of that time for Dorothy, she'll be able to spend it on other things that could potentially bring more money into the business. Is that right? Potentially. Okay, perfect. Um, well, is there anything to this point that you think I've missed or that I should consider going forward? No, at this point, like I said, it just. Um I keep going back to that word you mentioned earlier, premium, and premium makes me nervous. Absolutely. Premium gets expensive. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, let me go ahead and, you mind if I screw around and show you our uh, demonstration here? So we've got an EDP run mobile application, mm -hmm. which is going to be, um, have, let me walk through the process, I guess. Okay. So I'm an employee, and I come to work, and I clock in, right? Got it. Uh, at the end of each week, you will, uh, you or Dorothy, whoever decides to actually do it, will have everything input automatically from our system. Uh -huh. So it's going to skip the managers essentially, essentially. Right. saves time there. Okay. And then you're going to see, uh, well, I'll show you the totals and things of that nature, but it's all going to be automatically sent to Dorothy. And then she has to go in and approve it. Okay, so the managers, that concerns me a little bit. Okay. They, they manage the P&Ls for each of the locations, and I don't want to take that away from them. So they need to see the roll-up. Sure, sure. We can. So I don't want to cut them out of that loop. That yeah, absolutely. Sense? So the managers are playing an important role, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? You want to keep it that way? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, what we can do, the managers can actually pull up a report each week or, or whenever they want mm -hmm. and see where time is, uh, total cost for that week, and things of that nature on there. 
So you think that would be something that would benefit you? So they would be able to have access to see what their expense has been from a payroll standpoint to the overall business? Absolutely. Yeah, because when you're saying you cut the managers out, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. I don't want to cut the managers out of anything. Sure, sure, sure. So what we'll do is, and I'll have you actually go ahead and control it if you would. This is our run mobile application. This is how we're going to walk through the process. So this first shows us the week that we're in. Okay. So we'll hit resume here. And there we go. And so this screen is going to allow us to see all of our employees. So some are salary, some are hourly. So that's easy to change. And if you want, you can go ahead and select on one of these employees on there. And you can just pick one of them. And it will pull up some details about that particular week. So Sandra is $37.50. All right. So that's 37 and a half hours that she's worked this week. And currently it shows that she gets paid $16.73 an hour. And, of course, this is going to keep track of things like vacation and sick leave and anything else that you would like to include in there. So that's something that is easy to keep track of there. And once you go through and approve each employee, as I said, it's all automated. But you'll hit preview and calculate. And this is going to calculate the preview, or excuse me, calculate the payroll for this total period. Okay. For just her? No, for everyone. Everybody that's rolling in there. Yes. So this screen is going to show the total cash required to pay your employees for that period. Uh-huh. And so once you're okay with that, you can see details on each employee, things of that nature. But you just hit approve and approve payroll. And that's actually the end of your process. Everything else is done by ADP. We cut the checks. We'll send it to your employees or deposit it however you would like to set it up. Overall opinions, I guess, on the application so far? Well, it's interesting. How do you handle things like holiday weeks? Are you asking about how the hours change? Well, just how do checks get cut? You know, if you've got, you know, where you pay, for example. When we typically check with pay. Absolutely. So we can set those up in advance. They can just be automated to renew annually. Or you can do it manually if you want. Most people don't because it just takes more time. But, you know, you can do it either way. Okay. So the managers can look at this report. They can see where they are. Dorothy can get her act together and she can see this. Absolutely. Can I look at it as well? Yeah, absolutely. You've got to log in. You'll have a log in. And for the demo, you don't have one. But you'll have one. Dorothy can have one. You can set it up for each individual manager if you'd like. Okay. And I know we are kind of running close on time. And we did want to address cost. I don't think we have time because I know you said you've got 20 minutes. Give me a ball sack. Sure. So, as I said, you're at about $10,400 right now. With the ADP, paying your employees weekly, you're looking at about a little over $9,000 for the year with the amount of employees that you have now. It'll save you about $1,000 so far. That's not a huge change over what I'm dealing with in terms of my current supplier. Sure. You know, and then you've got the hassle of even changing. Sure, I understand that. You've got to pull the plug on that, and then they're going to go, oh, you're breaking my heart, why are you leaving? And then I've got to tell all the managers we're going to do something new and different. You know, I don't know. I'll tell you what we can do. Since it is something that, obviously, we may be on the fence about, I'll give you some paperwork. I've got a packet there for you. Okay. And something that we can address, just so you know, we do come in and train your managers and you and everyone on the new process. Uh, which was something we'll get to later on. Yeah. Just for the sake of time today, um, mm -hmm. I do want to wrap it up and okay. see if you have any other questions uh, about our meeting today or anything like that. No, if you've got some information, you can leave. Yeah, and, and absolutely. Be thorough with your uh, your recap and what you had here. If you've got some of that information, I'll, I'll take that. And absolutely. And I'll think about it and I can get back with you. Okay, perfect. And uh, could we agree on a next appointment, maybe next week or two weeks out? Um, give you a call to schedule that? Sure, if you want to give me a call, I can check my schedule and we'll see what we can yeah. set up. Okay, perfect. Well, Mr. Arnott, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank Appreciate you. It. That was a little different than the first round, definitely. <laughs> that's okay. Um, All right, so that's what a competition looks like. That's what your presentation should be, something like that. You can look at the rubric online as well. I posted it on D2L. So look at that and think about going through this and what we'll do is we run out of time. So I will, um, on Tuesday, we'll do the first one of these. If you look at the course syllabus and course documents page, that will come up. The rubric is there. If you will bring this, I'll have some extras in case you forget it. But um, 
look at this and sort of think about the process that we went through in this, in this demonstration. So for the advanced class, we train them on ADP because that's what's sold. We train them on whatever is going to be sold at the National Police and Sales Competition at Kennesaw State. Um, it's historically been ADP, but I think they're actually changing the partner this year. So that's what they'll sell, but this is what a sales presentation looks like at competition. Yours should be something like this. You will get to choose the product that you get to sell. So you can choose what it is that you want to sell to your partner and work with your partner. So everyone will have to buy something, and everyone will have to be a seller. There we go. If you go to the course syllabus and course documents, you can click on the sales presentation rubric, and it will pull up the form that I gave you today so you can think about this. So just think about what you saw, look at the rubric, kind of familiarize yourself with that, and we'll watch another one on Tuesday.